Welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 21. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I am very excited today to introduce my special guest, McKeel Haggerty. McKeel, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? Ready as always. Can't wait. Okay. It's great to have you here. McKeel Haggerty is president and CEO of Haggerty Insurance Agency, a premier classic car and vintage boat insurance company. They protect over 700,000 vehicles, 10,000 boats, and 25,000 motorcycles. Haggerty Insurance gives back by donating 10% of their net revenue to programs and organizations devoted to preserving the hobby. McKeel is a hands-on leader who truly cares about cars and collectors and, of course, his employees. Cars and wooden boats have been a part of his life, and at 13, he and his father restored a rusty 1967 Porsche 911S, which he still owns today. A leader in his industry and a true enthusiast of the hobby, McKeel is a car guy through and true, and I'm happy to say that all my collector cars have been protected by Haggerty Insurance for over 10 years, so thank you, McKeel, for providing me with some peace of mind. So, McKeel, I've told our listeners a little about you, so please take some time and share more about your history, your life, your business, your interests, and, of course, your passion for automobiles. Well, sure. Thanks for that uh, very nice introduction. I've, um, yeah, I've said many times to people, and, and I say it again, I've, I've been able to build a sort of car guy's dream life um, in the past 25 years or so. Um, I grew up in a, in a family, um, you know, uh, my dad was a hobbyist, and I, I say that kind of in the full sense of that. He was a tinkerer um, with cars and, and wooden boats, and from, you know, some of my earliest memories and some of the earliest uh, photographs of me, um, either myself or with my, my dad where I was, you know, in the garage or him playing around with cars or, you know, motorcycles or some sort of wooden boat thing going on. And it's just sort of who we were and it was how um, we spent our time. And, you know, as, you know, you, you sort of age and you grow up and you, you start off on your own. My, my parents actually had a huge change in their, their own business life. They sold a general insurance agency that insured everything from, you know, cars and homes and life insurance and all that sort of thing and started up this hobby business really in the basement to insure wooden boats. So suddenly, you know, the things that we used to um, love on a sunny uh, summer afternoon on a lake up here in northern Michigan, which was our, our favorite thing to do, was go water skiing or hang out on wooden boats. We were now in the business, um, going to boat shows um, or what we did for now uh, summer fun at that point and, and just – it just became part of our lives, and that business grew a lot. Um, I went off to school, and then graduate school, and then more graduate school, and and I kind of came up with this idea of starting a um, a classic car business, insurance business, on the side of that that boat business that my parents still had, and was now that business was quite successful. And I never intended it to be big. I never intended it to be even my job. I just thought it'd be like a cool way to make some extra income, maybe go to a few car shows instead of boat shows. And um, it just took off. It just really, really took off. And so I I actually quit my Ph.D. program that I was in in the mid-'90s and moved back and and took this little thing from, um, you know, a few employees and kind of a good idea and a lot of competition at the time and uh, really threw myself at it. And, um, you know, the rest in a lot of ways is history. But I've also deepened in the car world since then, too, because I've gotten in that, you know, I get to go to the kind of many of the great car events and drive in a lot of the great car events and, and have been able to meet many of my own automotive heroes along the way and, you know, count many of them as friends now. So it's just been a, it's been a glorious journey. And I would have never thought ever that I could make a life, not just a living, make a life around these things that we like so well. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm truly blessed. It's been a great time. Well, that's an incredibly inspirational story, and that's what Car Jazz is all about, is reminding people who are passionate about automobiles, wooden boats, motorcycles, trucks, whatever it may be, there is a possible way to create a career and a life around your passion. And you're a premier example of that. And 
want to thank you also, and we'll talk about a little more as we get on with our conversation about everything that Haggerty and, and what you do to give back to the collectible world and people that have a passion for these automobiles. So uh, wonderful story and uh, so happy that you're, you're getting to live your, your dream life. That's wonderful. As we continue on your journey, I always like to start with a success quote. A saying that's been instrumental in forming your success in your life. It's a great way to get the inspirational tires turning. Take the wheel, McKeel. Well, I'm a I'm a big reader, um, and I'm a big fan of quotes, and they always are a great way to frame your mind. So, uh, I you know it's tough for me to pick one, but I'm going to pick the one that has probably you know continues to challenge me, which is it's a Tom Peters quote, and he's not it's not like Shakespeare, but it's the bottleneck is always at the top of the bottle. Can you give us maybe some concepts of how you've incorporated that into your life and what that means to you and especially your passion around cars? Well, yes. I mean, I think, you know, from the beginning of, again, I I shared moving back from, you know, kind of quitting my graduate program. I thought I was going to be a philosophy professor at this point in my life and, you know, walking around with a tweed coat with leather patches on the sleeves and, um, you know, to... Once I got into the business and then kind of took the business over, I had been working with my sisters at the time who were heavily involved and my parents. And then when taking it over is I realized we were really, the potential for our success was only limited by our vision. You know, we, when you find yourself in a competitive environment or you find yourself in a, um, in a, you know, some sort of industry or some sort of world, you're, you just tend to react to what that world is. And I realized we can redefine this. Um, and, I can redefine this. I'm I'm capable of figuring these industries out and these challenges and getting to know the car world differently. And so I've really set myself out on the on the mission of making myself better and and broadening my own horizons so that I could create a bigger vision and and remove that bottleneck at the top. And you know, and across the board, both in the technical aspects of our the insurance business, but you know, right down to you know, I'd never been to the Pebble Beach Concours before. Um, I'd never been to the Mula Melia before. I'd never been to these things. Maybe I'd read about them. And, you know, then, well, why not go? Why not figure this out? And, um, you know, why not become part of that whole world? I mean, I've now judged at the Pebble Beach Concours for 15 years, and I've been to many of the great car events and participated in many of them. And it's I, I realized I was only limited by my vision of thinking oh, I don't belong there, or, you know, those are for other people, or those are for really wealthy people, or those are for, you know, people who have a lot more experience in the car world or or knew much nicer cars than I grew up with. I mean, the cars I grew up with were not a bunch of Ferraris, even though I had that that 911S, that was $500 out of a newspaper. And uh, I think that idea of broadening yourself and broadening your vision for your life is what, what creates success. Well, that's wonderful. And a philosophy professor, I assume you're familiar with Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? Of course, Robert Persick. I'm reading it right now. My son read it for the second time and said, Dad, you need to read this. Would you share a story with us that instigated your passion for cars? Tell us that pivotal moment when you knew you were a car guy. Yeah, uh, there were so many images and things from my, you know, my early days. And you know, as I said, I think, you know, working on cars with my dad probably were so many of those early, early, early phases. My dad was one of these guys who could kind of fix anything, anything mechanical. He could kind of do anything. And I just, you know, I wanted to be like that. So I was always sort of working with him and fixing things. But when it came time to restore that car for myself and, you know, to spend that, you know, what was certainly more than a year, year and a half scraping rust into my face um, (laughs) and, uh, you know, mechanically restoring the car and all of these sorts of things. It's really rewarding to just see that thing come together. And as a young man, you know, you're also in school and you're playing sports and you're trying to do all the rest of the stuff that you do in your life. But this was really building something and really putting something together. You know, I will never forget the day when, you know, the put the engine up back in the in the back of the car and, you know, we had it all wired up and it was, you know, when you crank that thing over and it starts the first time. You know, I remember my dad and I hugging each other and just what a thrill that <laughs> is to kind of have this, you know, we were no master mechanics, but we got this thing back together and it ran. I mean, my dad, what we were Ford, we were Ford family to sort of to make a Porsche engine run, you know, on our own. It was just a glorious moment. And you know, I lost my dad this, 
this spring in 2014 in March. And, um, you know, I miss him, but I, I will always have those memories with him. So I, it started right there, and I haven't let up since. Well, what a wonderful memory. My condolences for the loss of your father. And he's left behind a true legacy and some absolutely fantastic memories for you to carry on. So what a great story. Thanks for sharing that. So, Mikhail, what I want to do now is take a look, really go down the roads you've driven and crawl under the hood and get your hands dirty a little bit more. I'd like you to share a, a huge challenge, maybe even a failure that you faced, and maybe something that pushed you to a breaking point where you were about ready to just say, I'm done with this. But more importantly, how you overcame that situation and what you learned from it? Yeah, sure. You know, it's... um. I started my my automotive journey, you know, certainly with the business, with just going to events. I mean, I was the if there was a car event somewhere, I'd just get on an airplane or get in a car and drive and and get to it. And and certainly the probably the marquee events that and certainly the the events that get the most attention now in the world are are all the automotive auctions. You know, going to the auctions was just seemed like a natural place, seemed like a place we could be. There were tons of car guys, great cars. You know, lots of excitement, and um, it was just, I, I can't describe how frustrating um, it was to go to, you know, I've been to hundreds and hundreds of car auctions, you know. There is, uh, I swear that sound of the auctioneer blasting in my head, I'll never be able to get it out of my head. <laughs> um, and some some people are like, wow, isn't that exciting? And I just, oh. Sometimes it can really wear on you, the ziggity, yeah, ziggity, ziggity. Z- how do they oh, speak yeah. so fast? I don't know how they yeah, do that. Yeah, I'm going to, 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 I'm But it was, it was very frustrating to try to, I guess, kind of break into that world and, and kind of understand how those businesses work and some of the people that used to work in them. You know, I mean, it's at time, I've, I've been through the evolution of where it was a shadier industry to now where it's much more transparent. You know, the Internet and television have, have really cleaned that world up where, you know, it used to be kind of more of a sucker born every minute approach to selling cars to now, you know, they have to describe those things pretty well, you know, or they're getting them back or they're going to have us, you know, they're going to have a buyer come with money, guns and lawyers and try to unwind this thing. So it behooves them in the same way restaurants now have online reviews, right? So it's the same thing that happens and that's happened in the car world. It's a much safer, better place to buy cars. But, you know, for gosh, more than a decade, I just beat my head against this thing, trying to figure it out and trying to find the kind of allies that I thought I needed. Um, and I just, you know, and, and yet I just thought there's got to be a way. These, you know, these must be great companies. These must be great, you know, it must be a great opportunity. And it, and it just, they honestly just really weren't. And, you know, we still deal with some of them and we still, you know, go to a lot of auctions. But it just, um, it just was a, it was a really interesting learning curve. And then, guess what? Now that we're the size we are, and I realized, wait a minute, public auctions, all the auctions put together that everybody sees, are something like four or five percent of all the cars sold on an annual basis. Wow! So all this attention and all this effort that I put in, I realized I was not putting it in the right spot, mm. and that I wasn't letting the data do the talk. I wasn't learning from what I already knew. I just was con- so convinced that the attention these were getting is that that's where my attention had to be, and. Um, you know, now I, I respect the auctions. It is a much better place to, to you know, uh, buy a car and sell cars, but it's not our priority anymore. Well, wonderful story. It resonates in your brain, the ziggity, ziggity, humana, humana. Well, Mikhail, let's shift gears here and go to the other end of the spectrum. I'd like you to share a story when you had a real aha moment in your business, a time when you realized that an idea or concept really was going to make it. If you could tell us about that aha moment and how it led to success? Sure, this is a this is a great one for me. Um, you know, I I realized as our business was growing and we were you know getting into this automotive space, there were, there were really kind of two related thoughts. And one was, you don't get this question very much anymore as a business person. And people would you know, and it's the old one. You'd imagine like back in the fifties, people would ask, "What industry are you in?" It's a great, it's a heck of a question. At what industry are you in? And of course. You know, the, I guess the presumption is, you know, what what is it that you sell to make money to 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 live? And I guess I would have said in a lot of ways, while well, I'm in the insurance industry um, for a long time, and, and then I was contemplating this. I'm like, no, we're we're in the car business. 
we are in the car business. This is we're in the car industry. And when I sort of freed myself from that idea of the industry I was in, it allowed me to realize I, I can. I, this isn't just an incidental thing that I'm. We're ensuring all these things that people are very passionate about. It. We're actually in the business. We're actually in the car industry. So that was kind of the first part of it. The second part of it was this: C- creating a bigger company or a successful company. People see you doing well, and even if you are doing well, that's fine. But I just believe that doing well isn't going to be meaningful if you also don't do good at the same time. And so it was about 12, 14 years ago when we really set out on this journey of, you know, as you described, taking, a, you know, now what's 10% of our our operating margin and, and putting it back into the industry, really putting it back to fuel the thing that's feeding us. We didn't, haven't always done it all perfectly, and we've learned a few things along the way. But, you know, some of the things, some of the foundation efforts that we've had, um, the youth programs, um, launching um, and really founding things like the Historic Vehicle Association, the Collectors Foundation, um, our Operation Ignite programs, those all started in that idea of, one, what industry are you in? And then, two, how can you do well but also do good at the same time? And, you know, now it's really a mission. You know, I'm now you get excited about it and you find it and you get more and more passionate about it, and I've never been more passionate about it. But it was really those kind of, the, the string of those thoughts that helped me get to where we are today. Fantastic. You know, my next question was going to be about your first car, and, and we already talked on that 911S a little bit, but I would really like you to expand, maybe just spend a, a short little bit of time on these organizations you've put together to pay back the car industry. I'd like to give you a chance to, to tell people about them because I think they're tremendously important, and it's wonderful that you are giving back to really refuel people that are coming up in the industry, and especially children. But can you, can you talk about each of those real briefly? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I will never forget. I think it was 1997, 1998. Um, I was at the Meguiar's Car Collector Person of the Year Award, and Jay Leno was going to receive the award. And, and Jay was, you know, big news then, and as he has been every year since then. And um, I'll never forget being in his presence and having him see this award or received this award, and he got up on stage, and you know, of course he's funny. He's funny at everything he does. You've seen him before, and but then he kind of got serious, and he said, "I'm very concerned about the future of the car hobby. I'm I'm concerned that there are these arts that we all depend on in operating and using and restoring our cars that are going away. There are literally techniques and materials that people don't want to work on anymore, and that if we don't invest a little bit back in to it, that our you know our hobby, our interest is going to fade. And so that's when he first mentioned McPherson College in Kansas and introduced that that night that he had funded and endowed the Freddie Duesenberg Scholarship at, at McPherson College for a student to get for, uh, well, then a two-year degree from McPherson. And I was just I was just blown away by the message, you know, and the way he was able to kind of turn this. And I said, I want to get involved. And they, they started a advisory board at McPherson College back then. I was asked to join, and then we started funding some scholarships kind of just directly, and then I came up with this idea of kind of a Haggerty Fund and later the Collectors Foundation, which was really the idea of a foundation for the hobby, kind of by the hobby, that would help fund this future vision. And a lot of our funding, you know, now, um, oh my gosh, you know, over $3 million worth of scholarships have gone out to places like McPherson and other similar institutions around the country that where young people are going to learn to go into the business to be a professional in the collector car space. I've, you know, become a, I don't know, I'm certainly no expert, but I've certainly become a lot more knowledgeable about education and, and what's missing in vocational training. And I just, you know, I've I've fortunately, you know, had the um, many friends who have also been win- willing to contribute to this idea. I mean, I don't care if it's a hundred bucks here, or fifty dollars there, or ten thousand. Is if the car world has done something for you, I hope you'll join me in helping give back to it in some sort of meaningful way. And the Collectors Foundation was sort of that platform because we would vet the schools and make sure the right kind of kids are getting the the you know the money so that we really could see the long term benefit. We evolved the Collectors Foundation within the last year. It's now kind of back to being having the name Haggerty on it, and it's associated with the America's Car Museum, LeMay, out in Tacoma, um, which I think is the best um, 
you know, it's certainly one of the best success stories in the in the cl- in the collector car world of as a museum. But I'm just a huge fan of the board and David Madeira's ability to raise money against an important you know important causes and the thing and the future of the car world. And so um, we, we've kind of joined the organizations together. They're helping to raise money. We're giving it back to the all across the hobby and across the world. And it's all about education. It's all about the future. It's all about the, you know, because I believe kids are the keys to, to the future here. And I don't know what the measurable is, Mark. I've got to be honest. But I'll tell you what, when the first year I went to Pebble and had known about McPherson, I think there were only about two students on the field at Pebble Beach, the Concours, that were McPherson graduates actively working in the hobby. And every year they do a little class photo and, and you know, the, here are the two, here are the three, here are the four. Well, there were over 40 students this last year out at uh, out at, at Pebble who are collection managers working in restoration shops showing cars it was just it's fantastic and and I'm not saying that's all from the collectors foundation or the Haggerty education program but we've been part of it they're not the the school is in, in that period of time has now gone from 19 full-time students to 130 students and it's not a two-year degree it's a four-year degree and that's just the power of one idea coming out of Jay Leno and the collectors foundation I don't want to go on too long, but I do want to talk about the HBA. Sure, absolutely. Can. Sure. The other thing is I believe no matter what, we're, we're facing regulatory challenge in the collector car space. I think long-term there's going to be challenges to our ability to operate our vehicles that we love so much on public roadways. And I'm not a big political person. I'm admittedly not. I know nothing about lobbying. Um, it's, I, you know, I vote in elections, but I'm just not wired that way. And what I wanted to do is find out if there were any organizations that I felt were really doing this right across the world. And the one I found happened to exist in almost every other car collecting country except the United States. And that was called, it's called FIVA, the Fédération Internationale Vehicula Ancien, which basically means the Federation, the International Federation of Historic Vehicles. And I couldn't figure out what I, what I loved about what they did is they had really good, they had some good kind of lobbying and heritage efforts but they really were dialed into this idea of the car as history, not just as a possession, not just as an industrial object, but as history and culture. And they combine it with some lobbying and some activities to kind of more prominently feature it in their cultures, mostly in Europe. And so I got to meet these people across the world and said, well, why don't we just create the, you know, the FIVA chapter, if you will, the FIVA organization in the United States. And so we did. We called it the Historic Vehicle Association. Um, now, every member of the Haggerty, um, of kind of our main kind of Haggerty program is also a member of the Historic Vehicle Association for free. Um, they get the benefit of being a member of this worldwide organization. And what we're we're able to do is really start having a meaningful dialogue publicly and it's we're just getting started with this um, in the last two years about how we need to turn this from hobby to heritage heritage you know from just tinkering to culture and history and really elevate the collector car to a status that we hope could start reaching more of a historic and public preservation type thing so for example this year for the very first time the Department of the Interior and the Library of Congress um, have recognized the collector vehicle as an historic object right alongside the Statue of Liberty and the Washington Monument. And we helped get it in there, which was the Cobra Daytona Coupe owned by Dr. Fred Simeone. Wonderful. We just had the Maserati. Um, the second car was just inducted, the, the Indy Maserati. And it's these are just tests. These are just a way to learn to do it. And so now these car, these vehicles are considered part of American automotive history, just like those important buildings and those important objects. And I believe that we need to start with the best cars that are out there and get them this sort of protection. And then we need to move, you know, from there and have, you know, the great historic cars be able to be enjoyed publicly and receive that sort of recognition and protection 100 years from now, 200 years from now. And that's what the HVA does. So it's been fun. Thank you for sharing all that, and I assume people can go to the Haggerty website and learn more about these? Absolutely. And, of course, they both have their own websites, too, but it's um, you can you can jump on the Haggerty and, and get right to them. Well, I'll make sure that uh, I post those on the show notes page for your interview here at CarsYad.com. You just have to go to CarsYad.com slash McKeel Haggerty, and you'll be able to find those links and learn more about what McKeel's talking about. Thank you for what you're doing. That's really wonderful. Let's have a little fun here. Maybe not so much fun. Um, seller's remorse. Is there a car that you've sold in your past that you really wish you had back? 
You know, I have my dad's um, hoarding hoarding genes, so I don't sell anything. <laughs> good for good for you. Good for you. Uh, there are an awful lot of them. I wish I bought, as we all have wished we bought a lot of them along the way. But you know, I remember all those hundreds of auctions mm-hmm. I said that I went to back in yep. the day. Uh, when I think what some of those cars sold for. Well, oh. you can't look back. You can only look forward. I've said this many times on these interviews. Ayrton Senna had a great quote. The past is just data. I only see the future. Yeah. So there yeah, you go. that's the way you have to well, do it. That's all we can yeah. see. So. Is, there a, <laughs> is there a favorite way that you like to spend time in the garage with your cars? Is it wrenching, detailing, or restoring, or just going out and driving them? Yeah, I'm a driver. I I just get so much pleasure um, in driving cars, and you know I I don't have a huge collection of cars, but we have we have a few, and I just to me I love the different experiences of you know driving different cars at different times on different roads. And you know, last June, for example, I just challenged myself. I wanted to drive a Model T every day for a month. So I drove. I have a 1915 Model T delivered new to my hometown. 1915, you know, crank start brass radiator and it was just so much fun to just have that challenge and knowing that yep i might stall it in traffic (laughs) and i did (laughs) um you know it might something might go wrong it might not start and it did a few times i i I picked my wife up from uh the airport in it one afternoon and put her suitcase in the back and it was just you know you should have seen the security people Uh, they love it. And I just love those things. I mean, I drove a 51 Ford truck to the office this morning because it just seemed like a pickup truck kind of day. Oh, that's great. Well, I remember talking to a friend about that. He used to say, you put your string back gloves on and you move into a different mindset because the car doesn't go as fast and you just get in the right lane and enjoy it. And he was talking, he was talking about driving an MGTD. So, uh, yeah, the Model T would be in the far right lane, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but 32 miles an hour seems like 132. Oh, yes, I'm sure it does. <laughs> Mikhail, we're coming up on one of my favorite parts of our talk. I, I call it the last lap, and this is where I fire off a series of questions, and you give the listeners some very quick blips of the throttle answers. So are you ready? I'm ready. What is the best automotive advice you've ever received? Best automotive advice I ever received is don't lift in the corner when you're driving a 911. <laughs> yes, yes, very much so. <laughs> don't yeah, lift. Having owned many 911s, <laughs> don't lift. <laughs> Can you share one of your personal habits that you believe contributes to your success? I believe in habits more than I believe in goals when it comes to personal things. Um, I believe that we're a sum of our habits um, and that, in fact, you can add habits to your life that will make your, your life so much better. So I'm an up-in-the-morning early person. I say my prayers and do my stretching and have my workout, and I'm constantly tweaking it, and it's what makes me alive and awake and, and ready to take on the day every day. And then I finish every day, and I also write down three gratitudes every morning of things that I'm happy for. And then at the end of the day, the last thing I do before I go to sleep is I have a journal next to my bed that I write the things that I was grateful for that day and see how I did against my gratitudes from that morning. Oh, wonderful habits. Those are absolutely spectacular. Thanks for sharing those. Do you have a resource that you could share with our listeners, maybe a website, a supplier, restoration shop, or even a person that you're really fond of? Well, you know, there's so many great ones out there. You know, I, I like to keep my ear to the market. So I and because I learn so much from these knowledgeable people, you know, Keith Martin, the sports car market, the website, the, the magazine. I love reading the, the British um, car magazines, Octane and, and uh, you know, Classic and Sports Car. They just and, and I read them all. I read them cover to cover. I read the classified ads. I, I read how they talk about cars. Those things are just invaluable to me. So, and you know, who doesn't like bring a trailer? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that teaser that comes in the inbox mm-hmm. every day. Oh, yeah. I was with Jay Leno not terribly long ago, and he came and he goes, "How can you buy something off of that? Every time I go, they're already sold." <laughs> and I'm like, well, and "I'm on the East Coast, and they're already sold yeah. by you know nine in the yep. morning." Well, I'm gonna. I talked to Randy. He's going to be on Cars, yeah. So uh, maybe he can give us some insights into uh, that business and how he got that going. But it's uh, a fun email to get for sure. Yes. Nikhil, would you share a book with us that you've recently read that you really enjoyed? Well, I'm I'm a con- I always have five or six books going at um, at any one time. So I'll share a book that I, I like that I think is a real sleeper. Read The Undertaking. Hmm. 
by Thomas Lynch. Fantastic book. Um, he's actually a funeral director um, and a poet from Michigan. Just a well, it's just if I could construct one sentence as well as he does an entire novel. It's not a novel. It's just sort of a, a stories of his life and what he's learned about life and death from being a funeral director. But um, the best business book that I I always refer people to, or it's not the best, but a great one, is uh, Blue Ocean Strategy. It's just a fantastic book, and it'll help you remove the bottlenecks from your life. Well, you can find all these links that McKeel has talked about at carsyad.com slash McKeel Haggerty, and we'll post all these up there so people can uh, find these sources real quickly. Okay, now it's time for the checkered flag. So, McKeel, this last question can be a challenge for people. I like to call it a real doozy. If you could only have one collector car in your garage, something that you could not sell to buy other cars with, and money is no object, what would it be, and more importantly, why? Well, I'm, I have to admit, I, you know, I've had a chance to see many of the great cars in the world. Um, you know, all over the world. But if there's one that would be sort of like the Mona Lisa, um, if I could have it, it'd be the 722 Mercedes, the SLR. Mm. You know, to me, there's just something about that car, what it represented to think about Sterling Moss driving it the way he did in the Mila Milia. Uh, that, uh, I, I don't think you could get better than that. Great choice. Well, Mikhail, you've taken us on a fabulous ride today, and I've really enjoyed your stories. I want to thank you for sharing your journey with me and the listeners. If you could give us one parting piece of guidance before you drive off into the sunset in that Mercedes Gullwing, and let our listeners know what is the best way they can learn more about you and your business, and then we'll say goodbye. Sure. You know, I learned this advice um, a long time ago as I was trying to figure out the car world and how we could have a business and, you know, do well and be passionate about it and as is that I think we're all we all really desire to be very collaborative. It's great to meet people, it's great to meet potential partners. It's um it's really fun to work collaboratively in the car world because it's a community and it's a community of people um, that can help you out and, and it's, there can be some great things, but I will never forget a piece of advice when I was struggling with a partnership that we were trying to create in the car world. And it was a very well-known collector, a good friend of mine from Texas said, McKeel, you can do it alone. Mm-hmm. You don't need anybody. You're good enough to do it alone. Wonderful. I will never forget it. And I was, he also told me one other thing, which is, by the way, you pay now, you pay later, but you're going to pay, um, which was I also thought good advice, but it was maybe not in this context, but you can do it alone. And um, so, you know, it's been a it's been a heck of a journey to grow Haggerty. I figure I have another 25 years or so to go to see what we can do to the next level and, and really try to become more and more um, helpful to the larger automotive community and help make it, make it easier and and better and more fun for people to own and enjoy these cars. If you you know go to a car event, you're probably going to see somebody there. And if you see me, I hope you'll come up and say hi because um, I love to talk to car guys. And uh, you can always find us at www.haggerty.com. Well, listeners, you can find everything we've talked about at carsyad.com slash McKeel Haggerty. I'll put all the links up there so you can source everything that McKeel has told us about today. I want to thank you for being so generous with your time and your expertise and and sharing your experiences with our listeners. Until we talk again, we'll see you down the road. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!